Okay, great. Then I will call to order the um, April meeting of the Bloomington Board of Park Commissioners. And um, so Kim, could you start us with a roll call, please? Yes, Kathleen Mills. Here. Ellen Rodkey. Here. Israel Herrera. Here. Okay, and we don't have our fourth member, Jim Whitlatch, but we do have a quorum, so we can go ahead and proceed. Um, so, and just in case we have any loyal regular viewers who are used to seeing uh, a shorter consent calendar, we've um, had approval from City Legal to move some of our um, items, partnership agreements um, that are things that are pretty standard that we've done many times before, um, some of which don't even involve any um, financial situation. They've just, they're, they're just here for us to review. So those have moved into the consent calendar along with the business report and claims submitted and all the other things we usually see there just in the interest of time and making the meetings a little bit more efficient. So. We've had a chance to look at those for several days, thanks to Kim. So do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I'll move to approve. Second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, that motion is carried and then we'll move into our section B, the other business and start with Corey Hawkins which is the partnership agreement with Artisan Alley for traveling mural projects. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Corey Hawkins. I'm a program specialist at Banneker Community Center. Um, I'm here today seeking approval of a partnership agreement with Artisan Alley in support of a mutually beneficial program, the Rotating Mural Project, which will not only provide space for murals to be displayed at the Banneker Community Center, but also will engage Banneker summer camp participants in the creation of that art installation. Um, so Artisan Alley will coordinate the design and creation of multiple rotating mural panels, uh, pairing local artists, community locations, and students. Uh, the Banneker Community Center will facilitate a local artist, uh, Rochelle Brown, uh, working with Banneker summer camp participants to paint this eight foot by four foot mural panel. Uh, we're thankful for the support of Artisan Alley and city staff throughout, throughout this process. Um, we're excited <laughs> to have the opportunity uh, to work with an inspiring local organization. We hope this agreement will be a positive experience for all and allow for future collaborations and development. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thanks, Corey. I love the idea of the, the Banneker summer camp kids getting to work on this. That's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So any questions or comments from other board members? No, I agreed. I thought it was great that the summer camp gets to participate in that. So super excited for a new partnership. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I'll to approve. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, the motion's carried. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. And then next up is a partnership agreement with community partners for public health in the parks program. Hi, nice to see you all again. So uh, yes, I'm here. I'm Jess Klein, the health and wellness coordinator. I'm here to talk about public health in parks this afternoon. Thanks, Kim. So let me just adjust my view really quick. All right. So um, I'm seeking approval for the 2021 Public Health and Parks Partnership Agreement. This is an agreement with the Bloomington Parks and Recreation Department, Monroe County Health Department, IU Health Bloomington, and Centerstone Inc. The department has collaborated individually with these organizations for many years, um, and there's several programs and efforts currently underway. This specific agreement is to renew and support the parks initiative, which started last year and known as public health and parks. The program will come together um, as a result of a partnership 
among these four organizations to support the renewal of a part-time position within the parks department known as the park specialist. This is a seasonal position, um, as well as working with community health, um, the positive link office out of IU Health and harm reduction programming done, um, or the harm reduction coordinator with the Monroe County Health Department, as well as support from Centerstone Street Outreach. This is a cohesive, innovative approach to addressing public health in our community through our parks. Um, new in this year's partnership, we are taking a pre-existing partnership with the health department that encompassed the Sharps Containers Program, and we'll be rolling that into this public health and parks partnership. Um, essentially, it makes sense. The, the Sharps containers are a public health initiative. Um, it will reduce some staff time spent on, you know, paperwork and updates and things like that. Um, and all parties were more than willing to do this. Um, and this way, we're, we're all on the same page on the status of the containers. And um, really, it does affect the programming through public health and parks. And so that is the, the biggest update, but there are no major changes in in essence to the Sharps container part of the partnership. Um, Kim, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So a little background on the Sharps container partnership. Um, these are some numbers that I've pulled as you're well aware. We keep well track of numbers of syringes found in our parks. This will include, so um, 500 syringes disposed of in Switchyard Park last year outside of any designated containers because as of right now, there are no containers in Switchyard Park. However, that is proposed as a new location for this year. Um, multiple containers being installed at Switchyard Park. Um, last year in 2020, there were 875 syringes disposed of um, in the container at Seminary. So we best, we best guesstimate that um, the container that we have at Seminary can hold 100. And so clearly that was filled about eight, almost nine times throughout the year of um, 2020. So the three current locations are Seminary Park, Butler Park, and Building Trades. Um, all three of those still do have containers. And then last year, there were 1,080 syringes disposed of in Seminary Park outside of any container. So these were ones found on the ground, discarded in the grass, bushes, things like that, walkways. Um, this number does not include any that were found unused or unopened in boxes. So any that were just found in mass like that, but weren't used, not included in this number shown here. Uh, Kim, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. A little recap of 2020 public health in parks. The program last year was nine weeks. If you remember, I presented in August. This all came together really quickly last year. So from mid to late September through late November last year is when the program ran. And we had a park specialist um, in Seminary Park roughly eight to five uh, Monday through Friday for all nine weeks. So that averaged nine hours per day for 428 hours total. They were very present in the parks. Um, we got a lot of great insight from how, you know, the current status of things in the park from that. Um, we did start hosting the um, screenings last year. And so through those, we held four, I believe, actual screening days. And those were held either by the Positive Link crew or Monroe County Health Department. And from those, 37 people were screened for HIV and or hepatitis C. Some were screened for both, some was one or the other. Um, I don't have that specific data. The total budget for what was actually spent on this program last year is seen here for 10,000. $909.68. You can see a quick rundown of supplies that were distributed through this program last year. So obviously a lot of bottles of water, um, individual snacks, sanitizing wipes were extremely popular to help folks try and keep their belongings and their hands clean, hand sanitizer, disposable face masks. And then we were, uh, we were able to distribute winter hats, gloves, and then socks. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So this is what is um, what I'm proposing for 2021. So we're looking at a much longer schedule for the program this year, um, May through November, ending the week of Thanksgiving. So just almost to the very end of November for 32 weeks total. We would like to hold one screening per week this year. And this is a little confusing, so I'm going to try and explain it clearly. But what our vision is, is that we will alternate between hosts, so either positive link or the health department, and we will also alternate location. 
So theoretically for the first two weeks of the month, we'll be at Switchyard Park down by the BPD substation. And let's say week A is positive link at Switchyard, week B will be the health department at Switchyard. And then the, the second two weeks will be at seminary, same pattern. So like week C will be positive link at seminary, week D will be the health department at seminary. So that's sort of the pattern that the partners have agreed upon. Obviously there's you know flexibility with people's schedules and things like that. Um, within the budget, we proposed, you know, similar supplies and being able to distribute similar things as 2020, no major changes there. The park specialist position will remain a seasonal position with reduced number of hours this year. So three to five hours per week, one position, potentially hiring up to three to fill that position. We are actively working on hiring one person right now um, with a proposed budget of $8,206 and 75 cents. Um, these screenings will be similar this year with HIV and Hep C being the, the biggest focus. As supplies and staffing allow, we do hope to do um, COVID screenings, COVID vaccinations, and flu vaccinations in the fall, but that is all very dependent on supply and staffing ability. Um, Kim, you can go to the next one, if there is one. Okay, that is uh, that is all for me. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks, Jess. Any questions or comments from other board members? Yeah, I'll start with a couple of questions, Jess. Thank you so much. Um, that was really great overview. And it sounds like um, you have it really well covered with including Switchyard in it this year, since I, we've noticed so many more um, people in that park. Um, I definitely have noticed that outside of the BPD substation. Um, is your uh, estimated reduction in budget, is that just because of the hours of the park specialist? Is that where the majority of that savings is coming from? Because I saw it's like quite a, it's not quite a bit, but it's less than last year, but you know, almost four times the number of weeks. Yes, I think the reduction overall is because of fewer staff hours. The reason it's not such a sharp drop from last year is because the program is longer in duration, but it's only three to five hours staff, um, staff paid hours per week. So it kind of almost comes to the same amount because it's stretched so much further, but we're not paying them for, um, you know, close to 30, 40 hours a week. So that, right. that's, yeah, that would be the explanation. Okay. And is, um, that is that our cost on it because if I remember correctly, there's um it's a we partnered with other providers, and so do they have an expense in it too? No, so the okay. no funds are actually being exchanged, and the the park specialist position will be paid by us. Okay, uh, I think that's it. I don't know, Israel or Kathleen, do y'all have questions? Um, no, I, thanks for that overview, Jess, and and all the data there about the, the numbers of sharps. And I don't know if this is a question for you or maybe for Paula. I mean, I know this is not unique to Bloomington Parks. And when I'm on the national, you know, the website for the Parks Association, this sharps in parks seems like a growing problem. Are there any other things discussed or any other best practices in addition to the sharps containers just to cut down on the sheer number of, of needles and that are found? I think the, the placement of them is something that we have learned a lot about and something that we're changing slightly this year with looking at, um, as part of the, the partnership for this year, which I didn't touch on a whole lot, is um, purchasing new containers as well. And so the three that I mentioned at Switchyard will be, it'll hypothetically be one in each not stall, but each restroom, if it were gendered, it'd be one per gender, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, at Switchyard. Um, so have, and then also new ones at Butler and Building Trades, both of those being interior, because those are one stall each. And so the fact that they are more discreet, that is one suggestion I've received um, through various things I've worked on for Paula last year. I've been in contact with departments all over the country, and that is definitely a common suggestion, having a, a more discreet way of disposing because there's still such a huge stigma around the use of them and the fear of um, punishment for having one on your person, regardless of why. Um, so I think the specific location of the containers 
is is definitely one trend and a big part of discussion. Um, yeah, that I mean, in terms of parks realm of responsibility and what we can do around it, because the issue is so large, I think that that you know um, we're a, we're moving in the right direction and we're moving a little bit. Um, you know, we're we're being more creative with our solutions, I think, than a lot of other places. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that that helps a lot. Um, I don't have any other questions. I think if we'll take a motion on this one, this partnership agreement. Let's see. Ellen, do you want to move? Yeah, I'll move. I was just, I, sorry, I didn't know if Israel had questions. Oh, so yeah. I will move to approve. Thank okay. you, Jess. I second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, motion carried. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, Tim Street will tell us about the um, MOA with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for Lower Cascades. Hello, Park Board. Hope you're all doing well. Um, talking about the MOA with U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, I think you are all aware that we have a potential project uh, moving forward in the Cascades area. Um, we've heard some things about tree removal and planning, and it's uh, part of the ongoing phased project to improve trail, connecti trail connectivity in that area. Uh, so for the current phase, uh, the trail has reached a point where there is work both in the creek, uh, along the creek, uh, and on the stream bank for stabilization. Uh, because of that, we get into the Clean Water Act and we need a Section 404 permit, uh, which is regulated by the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, Part of that includes a historic review. Uh, and if you've been along Cascades Road, you probably know that the, the walls there are a, kind of a whole mixed bag of uh, some very old, some more modern, some concrete, some baskets with stone in them. Uh, but there are parts of the wall that are historic that date back to WPA uh, CCC installation uh, in the 30s. Uh, as such, the uh, review committee uh, put together from the Army, Co Army Corps of Engineers has suggested three things uh, that we do uh, to mitigate some of the historic effects down there. Uh, number one, we conduct a historic American landscape survey uh, to document historic assets in the park. Uh, that's basically just what it sounds like. It's a, it's a survey to go through and just document um, all of the assets that contribute to the historic uh, value of the property. Um, that's sort of been done already, but this is a more complete step uh, to, to really officially document those. Uh, number two, it would be installing interpretive historic signage after completion of the project, uh, which we, we fully support. Um, this is all pretty timely too, as Cascades Park, uh, Bloomington's first park approaches its hundredth year. Uh, you know, for the exact bicentennial, uh, this project's probably gonna be going on, but for a celebration at the uh, end of that centennial, excuse me, um, this would be a great step. Uh, and then number three, uh, probably the most significant would be applying for a National Register of Historic Places designation for Cascades Park. Uh, the exact borders of that would be determined um, through the process. We would work with the consultants to drive that process. It's, it's a fairly um, lengthy process, as I understand, that works through different um, state historic preservation offices, uh, gathering the relevant information, submitting, and um, waiting for feedback and approval. So. Um, all of these are, are the recommended steps uh, that we would agree to in order to get the permit to proceed with work. And we submit it for your approval and, and recommend approval. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Tim. Any questions from Ellen or Israel? No, that's great, Tim. Thanks for the update. And um, really cool to hear about uh, applying for a historic landmark designation. Yeah, that would that would be exciting if that comes through. So, yeah, any uh, Israel, any questions or comments? No, no. Okay. okay, then I think we're ready for a motion on this one. Yeah, I'll move to approve. And I, sorry, Helen. Okay. All right. All right. All, all the, in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. That motion is carried. And then Tim will also stay with us for B4, um, the contract with Shepherd's Construction for Cascades Golf Course Concrete Work. 
Yes. So you may be aware there's a fairly new uh, clubhouse at Cascades Golf Course. Um, there's an area between the clubhouse and the new uh, outdoor dining area um, that was that was unfinished, um, left with some dirt, maybe in hopes that, that grass would grow there, landscaping would be able to go there. Um, we are looking to, to complete the hardscape in that area at this point. Um, it will be better for traffic. It will create a nice plaza area and will set the stage for the installation of a golf course clock um, that will be coming through sports. Uh, so yes, the contract is for $7,000 uh, with, with Shepherd's Construction. They recently worked with us at People's Park, um, did a really nice job um, on the concrete work there, and we would like to use them again. Happy to answer questions. And so you mentioned, so is it, was it an area, I guess, that grass didn't grow or it just is an area that people walk through and it's kind of like an uphill battle or? Both, both and yes. Okay. And, and ultimately just completing the hardscape in that area. Um, it's, we're only talking about three to 400 square feet probably. Um, we'll, we'll make it better for, you know, the sustainability of the area and the, the foot traffic back and forth using that area. Okay. Yeah. The people's park one is really nice. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, Ellen or Israel, any questions about this one for Tim? No, I will move to approve. Okay. Second. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. That motion is carried. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. And then we'll go over to Joanna Sparks for the compost, green earth compost, green waste disposal agreement. Okay. Hello, this is Joanna Sparks, the city landscaper. I'm here today to um, request approval of a service agreement with green earth recycling and compost services to um, provide um, an as needed um, green waste recycling. Currently, um, the urban green space staff, urban forestry, and the vegetation management staff um, load woody vegetation into their trucks. And if we can, if it's not much, we haul it back to the operations center and put it into the yard waste dumpster there. But if it's full, it's just easier just to drive it directly out to the composting facility. So Aaron Hatch and I would like to have a service agreement with them so we can, um, yeah, just do that. I'd be happy to okay. answer any questions. Okay, good good price on this. I, I know my family personally uses them for our kitchen compost and it's been a great service. So um, any questions or comments for Joanna? No, okay. Alan, you wanna do the motion there? Sure, thanks Joanna. And um, yes, I will move to approve. A second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that motion is carried. And next, Joanna will tell us about the Ecologic Park Ridge East Park. Sorry, I don't have, usually I have a family member here for dog patrol, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm all alone here. So, okay, go ahead, Joanna. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I'm here to recommend approval of a contract with Ecologic um, to provide um, ecological restoration services at Park Ridge East Park. They, um, we, the park staff, um, the Park Ridge East Neighborhood Association and Ecologic have been working together for the last three years, actively um, managing invasive species on that property. It's a 4.5 acre property. It's a, it's a wonderful little pocket park in that neighborhood. and. The uh, over half of it was um, pretty infested with invasive species when we started and now um, it's, in, it's in much better shape and we're starting to see the, the end of the, the tunnel, so to speak, um, with um, our invasive management is such that we have been able to start installing some native plants in, in those areas and we would um, like Ecologic to continue the work that they did um, last year and the year before um, as part of a hand grant for the Neighborhood Association um, and just to continue their, their management of, of the invasives there as, as well as um, install natives. And the, the total contract is for an amount not to exceed $4,058.55. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And some great progress all around, not just in that park, but all around from the department on battling those invasive 
species. So, okay. It, it's, it, it feels pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I, just curious, Joanna, is there, um, sorry, Kathleen, did I cut you off? No, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, is there signage or anything in the park that help? like, I'm just thinking of, you know, the, I don't live in that neighborhood, but just thinking of the, the residents in that area and like sort of educating them on helping attack invasives because it's such a big issue in general. I know I've kind of seen stuff like that around like, oh, near Bryan Park, like in the median of Sheridan and South Downs, there's like nice, you know, it kind of identifies like this is an invasive. Is there anything like that in the air? Well, we, there is, there's signage on the butterfly garden, the native pollinator garden that was installed close to the shelter um, as part of the hand grant. We periodically post signs about our, um, our activities, but they're temporary. And, but we do have um, LOMO signs, basically um, letting people know that we didn't just forget about this place um, because it, it looks um, a little, Unkempt, um, but it is purposefully um, in low mo. But the signage is is definitely something to look at um, in 2022 budget, just because it's a little more pricey. And um, it, we we certainly are talking about it. And especially like I said, we're seeing the light um, at the end of the tunnel there, and, and and we actually we have something that you can really see some some visible progress. That's great. Yeah, that's great. And I think even just. Just being able, like, even if families are there and, um, you know, just sort of spreading the word, like, oh, they're, you know, this is kind of the work that they're doing um, is great. So, yeah. It is. And, and one plus with, with the hand grant is um, the entire neighborhood was involved in the process. So everybody got an, a, there, and this was pre COVID. Um, so there was door knocking. Everyone in the neighborhood heard from the, the folks who were pursuing that funding. And um, and a, a large portion of the community has come out to volunteer because their hours, volunteer hours are required as part of the grant. And each volunteer is only allowed to do so many. So one can't just rock it out and <laughs> cover all the bases. Everybody needs to participate. So it, it really is um, just, it's pretty, um, exciting to see that community come together and and um, yeah and the butterfly garden has really helped having that fen that the, the it's a fenced in area for to keep the deer out and people can just come and walk through it and 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 there are a lot of native plant zealots in that neighborhood so there's pretty much um, every day there's somebody in there working and um, happy to answer questions. Yeah, that's great to hear. Very cool. I, I caught the part about the hand permit um, at the beginning. So that's great. I love to hear that. I um I will move to approve if we're good. Okay. Right on. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Uh, motion is carried. Thank you, Joanna. Okay, thank you all so much. And next up, Barb Dunbar will tell us about the staff uniforms agreement. Is it Aramark? Am I saying Aramark? That, that is yeah. correct. Okay. Good afternoon, Barb Dunbar, our operations coordinator. So I'm here today to seek approval for a three-year service agreement with Aramark for the operations division. And Aramark will provide weekly laundered uniform and mat services. The funding source is from the uh, operations general fund budget. We have been utilizing Aramark for these services since 2018. And for the most part, we've been very satisfied. The four union staff that elect to be a part of this um, are really liking it. And I think we're gonna be, I think one more will be added here in the next uh, few months. Um, the, uh, this type of work where is much more suited to the work that these guys are doing every day, as opposed to the type of uniforms that are purchased like what I'm wearing now the typical staff shirts with the embroidered logos that the recreation division and sports division utilizes so this works out well for the uh, operations division staff um, it's a 50 percent cost share between the city and the employee and the, the employees portion is paid through a weekly payroll deduction 
So I'm, um, if you have any questions, I can answer those, hopefully. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Yeah, I remember this contract from before and yeah. things all seem to go well, so. Okay, any questions or comments for Barb or otherwise we'll take the motion. Okay, no? Okay, I'll second. Okay. Uh, I think, all right, I'll, <laughs> okay. We were a little backwards, I think. So we got a second. I'll make the motion. Ellen already seconded. So now all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. That motion is carried. So, and then Barb will also tell us about the contract with Sinclair Recreation for Winslow Woods Playground. Okay, so this one's a little bit more lengthy. Um, the, we're recommending approval of a contract with Sinclair Recreation for the purchase and installation of poured in place rubber safety surfacing at Winslow Woods Park Playground. This is a bond project um, and it, it includes a complete repra replacement of the existing Winslow Woods Park Playground, which originally was installed in 1990. The department utilized the request an RFP process for this and um, a legal, we, that process involves a legal ad being published with two print dates providing notification and RFP packets were posted on the Bloomington plan room site. Email notification is sent out to 17 playground vendors directing them to this plan, plan room site. The RFP specifies design preferences, standards and guidelines, safety and warranty requirements, accessibility and age use requirements and equipment and material specifications and preferences. A site plan designating the space allocation for, for the area is also provided. Play equipment components and the arrangement of those components, components are left to the expertise of the play equipment company and are submitted for our review. The RFP process allows us to consider a variety of factors such as price, integration of play events, appearance, aesthetics, and general, a general fun factor. Consequently, the process is not a low quote wins in this case. Each submittal received was thoroughly evaluated by operations division staff. A weighted evaluation criterion is utilized to assist in the determination of purchase recommendations. Proposals are, and each of the proposals are evaluated using five weighted factors, aesthetic and appearance, play value, accessible components, how the design addresses our guidelines and specs, and the cost, quality, and delivery. In addition, designs with the top seven scores were put into a Winslow Woods Park Playground family survey and sent out to a parent contact list for our Kids City Break Days. Parents' comments were received and considered. The final three designs were then selected and reviewed in more detail and a finalist is chosen. Port in place rubber safety surfacing will be installed by the vendor. Our goal is to begin construction late spring, early summer. Seven vendors submitted proposals for this project for a total of 17 designs. So what that means is four vendors submitted uh, two designs, two vendors submitted four designs, and one vendor submitted one design. So altogether, we had 17 different designs to look at. Um, the, total cost, the total project cost for the surfacing is 21,200. The total equipment cost is 97,800. But the, the, what I'm seeking approval today is simply for the surfacing contract, because that is the service that re purchasing equipment doesn't require a contract, but providing the installation of the surfacing requires the contract. So that's what you're approving today for the 21,200. And any questions about that? Okay. Thank you, Barb, for the explanation. And also it helps to know why, I mean, it makes sense that in playground replacement, you wouldn't just automatically choose the lowest price because if it's not handicapped accessible or kids don't find it fun, then it's not a very successful playground. So I appreciate that explanation. Yep. So, and this is just for the surfacing, right? You're, you're approving the surfacing for the right. contract for them laying the surface, correct? Okay. Any questions or comments from Ellen or Israel? Okay. Uh, I was just yeah, going to say thank you. Also, um, all of the information in the packet was really 
just kind of interesting to read through and uh, the, the whole process. So I appreciate you giving that overview. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty intense process to choose from 17 designs when they're they're all unique in their own way. Everything has something that the other doesn't have to offer. So it's not easy picking one. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. I I have more decision fatigue in my life these days. I just want three things and then call it good. Just let me pick from three. <laughs> I will move to approve. Okay, thanks. Take on. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And then there's a, looks like, is there an addendum here too? We, we, all, we already have an addendum. So, okay, yeah, so okay. what happened here was the, um, we're recommending the uh, approval of this contract addendum. You might look at this as a change order in a sense, but this, I was asked, um, I was, I was, um, it was suggested I, I do this with an addendum process. So the RFP for the Winslow Woods Park Playground project specified requests for purchase of play equipment and purchase of installation, as you know, for the port in place rubbers, surfacing only. However, after accepting the vendor's bid, a large enough balance remains to allow the department to include the cost of installation of the play equipment as well. So we feel it would be in our best interest to take advantage of that opportunity. And so we received a quote for that from Sinclair, the same company that we're purchasing from and who's doing the install of the surfacing. Um, and that's what this is all about. So this reflects the cost for installation of the playground equipment for $31,500. And we're still well within our budget if even with that added on. So that's what we're looking for approval today for. And then, oh, Kim has some photos. I'm sure you guys are dying to see what it's gonna look like, right? <laughs> so Kim has some photos of the design. Oh, wow. Different angles. I think there's another, it shows there's some, on the outer edges, there's some musical equipment and a neat little playhouse. Okay. That is great. I Thanks, yeah, I, I was uh, I was over at the Winslow Woods <laughs> area a few times yeah. recently. It, it's it's a little shabby over there. The oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. It's I mean, this is a good picture here. You can see I'm I'm sitting here pointing at it like you guys can see me pointing. Um, <laughs> you can see back where the the arch swings. We will keep those in place and we will just repaint the arch swings to match the the new color on the playground. And I've added. I've already ordered one of those new parent tot swings where you face face each other for that um, swing set as well. So that arch swing will remain in place and the, the it will still connect, the two will connect like you see in that photo. Okay, all right, great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks Barb, that looks great. It's a really neat design. I will move to approve. I'll go ahead and second. I think Israel got bumped out of the meeting for a minute. So he's, I think he's uh, coming back. Does he, does he have uh, is he audio and, vid and video? He is back in. We do okay. need to make him co-host again. Okay, because okay. we need to hear his vote. Yeah. Take on. Take on. Oh, there we go. Right on it. Okay. <laughs> All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Motion carried. Thank you, Barb. Thank you. And then we'll move to Aaron Hatch to tell us about the contract with Davy Resources Group for young tree pruning. Hi. Um, I am recommending approval of an agreement with Davy Resource Group for small tree pruning services in the downtown area, specifically for street trees. Um, and this would be for an amount not to exceed $15,417.15. Um, this, we have contracted Davy Resource Group before to conduct the 2019 inventory, um, but this will be our first time uh, requesting any tree pruning services with them. Um, this will be for trees from seven to about 14 inches in diameter at various locations kind of downtown. Okay, and this is 
pruning for just obviously it says broken branches or things that stubs that were improperly pruned before or so this would be pruning for uh, street and sidewalk clearance, but also conducting uh, kind of structural and training pruning on those smaller trees um, to make sure that they have proper form as they get older. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. Any qu other questions for Aaron from Israel or Ellen? Uh, no, I think that sounds great. I know street trees in particular can, and sidewalk trees in particular, need a, the right shape and everything. That's also for the help of the tree. So I will move to approve. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Okay. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you to your cats there in the background. <laughs> thank you. Okay. And Rebecca Swift will tell us about this. We've got another little addendum with aquatic control. Yes, hello. I'm Rebecca Swift, Natural Resources Coordinator for the City of Wilmington. I'm here to recommend a contract addendum with aquatic control. Uh, you may recall um, I've been here before and Elizabeth before me to recommend contracts working with aquatic control to manage the invasive Eurasian water milfoil in Griffey Lake. So the reason this is an addendum is actually because we've had such success out there controlling the invasive that we haven't needed to use as much funds to pay for treatment. So we have quite a bit, um, exactly $6,521.25 left over on this contract. Um, and Indiana DNR, who supports the Lake and River Enhancement Program, who supports this treatment and actually pays for 80% of the cost of this, um, has approved us to use the unused funds from last year's contract. Uh, Aquatic Control resubmitted a bid. It came in actually under what's left on the contract at 5,609. Again, the Lair grant will pay for 80% of this service cost, while the rest of it will come from natural resources non-reverting. Um, happy to answer any questions, but uh, again, this is really just extending the contract completion date, as well as updating the Exhibit A and Exhibit B scope of work and uh, work schedule. Okay, all right. Thank you, Rebecca. That is a, that is a good deal, 80% of it being paid for and nice to hear about success out there with that that Eurasian milfoil I know that's been a sticky issue so okay any other questions or comments on this one no I echo your thoughts completely and thanks Rebecca I will move to approve okay yeah. Yeah. we have a second Second. Okay. And all those in favor, please say aye. 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 That motion is carried. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. And then Steve Cotter is back to tell us about White Buffalo again with the, the chat program. Hello. Hello. This is Steve Cotter. I'm trying to start my video, but it doesn't seem to want to come on. <clears throat> uh, well, my apologies. I'll keep trying. But I'm here today to seek approval for a contract with White Buffalo Inc. for a 2021 Community Hunting Access Program hunt at Griffey Lake. Um, deer management at Griffey started really 10 years ago with the formation of the Deer Task Force. They made a recommendation that lethal methods be used to remove deer from Griffey Lake Nature Preserve. And in 2017, a sharpshooting effort removed 62 deer from the two square mile preserve. Uh, since then, the Department of Natural Resources has really um, encouraged municipalities to use local hunters, Indiana deer hunters, to remove deer from urban and suburban properties. So they created the Community Hunting Access Program and provided some funding with that. And in 2019, we successfully 
uh, applied for that program and hunters removed 26 deer from the preserve. Last year in 2020, hunters removed 40 deer from the preserve. And we are trying again to um, hire white buffalo to recruit hunters, train them, and to do proficiency screening to make sure that they're good shots. Um, the hunters all hunt from elevated tree stands at least 12 feet off the ground so that their bullets are traveling in a downward trajectory. <clears throat> and we've been very happy with white buffalo uh, to date. The timeline for the 2021 hunt would coincide with the opening of deer firearm season in Indiana. Uh, the, so it'd be three weekends in November, November 13 and 14, 20 and 21, 22, or excuse me, 13, 14, got to consult my calendar and make sure and get the dates right. Apologize, they, they seem to be incorrect on my uh, staff reports. But those weekends are the 13th and the 14th, the 20th and the 21st, and the 27th and 28th. The amount of the contract is not to exceed $29,475, which is actually a little bit less than last year. And there will be a security firm hired to patrol the perimeter of the preserve during the hunt to make sure that people are aware that the park is closed for the hunt. Uh, it will be closed from 11 p.m. on Friday until 5 a.m. on Mondays on those weekends. And the long-term management plan, is, the goal of the plan is to keep deer herd numbers down low enough so that the understory forest vegetation can recover. And I've asked him to share a couple illustrations. Um, the first one shows plant heights of indicator species. And these species were chosen because deer like to eat them. Um, and we're seeing very slight increases in the uh, heights of these plants. Uh, there are three different plants shown on this graph. Um, and the, the overall heights, average heights of all plants are slowly creeping upwards. We think that we need to keep the deer pressure down for a long period because there has been a high level of deer browse pressure at the preserve for decades. Um, and Kim, if you could show the next slide. Uh, the good news is that the, the heights of the plants are going up, but the flower trends, um, which of course indicate whether the plant is reproducing or not, uh, have not really shown much improvement yet. Jack in the pulpit is up a little bit overall, uh, but Solomon seal and trillium, which again are good indicator species, are still flatlined. So we realize that we still have some work to do, keep the deer, deer browse pressure low enough uh, that these plants can recover. And basically what happens is the deer munch off the top of the plant and then it cannot put more energy down in underground um, into the root system, which makes it difficult for that plant to reproduce. So we think we're on the right track, but there's still a lot of work to do. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks, Steve. Any questions or comments from Ellen or Israel? Thank you. Uh, remind me the date for the hunting season. It is three weekends in November, uh, beginning with the third weekend of the 13th and the 14th, and then the two successive weekends after that. So 20, 21st, and the 27th and 28th. And, and we are asking, uh, so to uh, start the contract with um, with the company for that, or they should be doing something else before? 
Well, they begin recruiting hunters about this time of year. Uh, we're fortunate that we've had a lot of great hunters take part the last couple of years. So we have a pretty good idea of uh, who may be willing to participate, but they do uh, begin recruiting in May usually, and then they do the proficiency screening at a shooting range later this summer. Yeah, thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? Thanks, Steve. No. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Go ahead. Yeah. No, that's just a quick question. So the recruitment is going to be just done by a White a Buffalo Inc. So uh, is there any kind of uh, like a report that they will share with, uh, with you, with your office? Yes, they do. Uh, the Community Hunting Access Program requires a post-hunt report uh, be submitted to the Department of Natural Resources, and they always share that with us as well. Right, and the, and the recruitment process, is it started by them, or is there any, any a, a, a stage that is done by your office? We take calls, and then we add names to a list that we then turn over to White Buffalo, and they send a solicitation letter to those hunters who can apply for the hunt if they wish. Uh, we also get a couple lists from the Department of Natural Resources from potential hunters who have offered to help with hunts like this. Thank you, Steve. Okay. And thank you, Steve, for that update on how the vegetation is doing out there. And, and uh, it's good just to be, be aware of the impact that the previous hunts have had. So. I think, uh, Ellen, I think we're ready for a motion on this one, B12. Yeah, I'll move to approve. I second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All Thank right. you very much. Thanks, Steve. That motion's carried. And then um, our final two things under section B, John Turnbull will tell us about partnership and a contract for tennis instruction and tennis pickleball courts, tennis technology. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, John Turnbull, Division Director of Sports. Uh, before you is a partnership agreement um, that is really of a classic nature for someone to teach tennis and run the tennis program. And we use our skills in point of sale and registration and publication, publicizing, um, the tennis lessons. This partner is a tennis coach at Bloomington South, Kathleen, you're probably familiar with uh, Matt Corey, uh, yeah. has a vested interest in tennis, passionate about tennis, has access to a lot of young players that are good instructors. We, we admittedly were having trouble um, finding good instructors and just getting a boost in the program. So this partner was identified pre-COVID, so 2019, we had a verbal agreement, but we didn't bring it to you in 20 because of COVID. It just, tennis didn't happen. So um, we're, we're real gung-ho on this. Uh, we just think it's a, a better fit and a better way for us to get involved in tennis lessons. Okay. All right, great. Yeah, I, I do know Matt and he will be, he will be really helpful for that, so. Any questions about this partnership for tennis instruction? No, I mean, it seems like a really good move to allow him to manage all of that um, instead of trying to hire and train your own instructors. So. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree with that. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Okay. All right, Ellen, you want to do the motion on this one? Oh, sure. I will move to approve. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. That motion is carried. And then John will also tell us about the contract with tennis technology. Sure. This one has been uh, pushed aside from the agenda. So, um, oh, this yeah. is. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no. I mean, in, in the prior agendas. I'm oh, sorry. oh, so, oh, okay. Uh, 
Okay, so I don't want it pushed aside okay. now. <laughs> there are a couple mistakes in their mind. Um, <clears throat> the funding source is a general obligation bond series B as in boy, um, instead of what it says in the staff report that it's the RCA <clears throat> TIF fund. So I just wanted to correct that for you. Also, I think Daniel's uh, on this and I talked on this call and Paula, I talked to the controller today. This wasn't the cleanest quote uh, process. Basically, um, <clears throat> we had some uh, add-ons that we wanted to do if allowed. And um, the, the high quote uh, company in Leslie Coatings was just way high. It became clear they didn't want to come down and do it. The next one of AG Sports uh, <clears throat> sent their estimator down the day before it was due and it was snowing. I don't know if you remember that big snow in February that we had, the one big snow that we had. And they basically said, we'll, we'll quote the basic job, but we're not going to send the guy over and we're not, there's it's snow covered. And they kind of let us know. I don't think they mind me saying that they had so much business they weren't interested. So anyway, we're proposing tennis technologies. Uh, they are a good company. We like uh, the work that they've done prior. To, uh, RCA Park, I was going to call it Thompson. RCA Park Courts, if you've seen them, they're in desperate need of recoding and some crack repair. So I'm really excited for the pickleball players and the tennis players to get a new surface with this contract. Okay, thanks for clearing up those things too. Um, all right, any questions or comments for John about this one? Is that the same company that resurfaced the ones uh, last year in Bryan Park? Correct. And there's a low spot at Bryan that they have agreed that they're going to fix the low spot in one of the courts at Bryan. So. Is that what's meant by the bird bath? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe we were fixing an actual bird bath. But now, I get it. <laughs> now I get it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you, John. Just, just um, <clears throat> mind us. What's the change that uh, you're saying that is uh, that is need to be looked at? In yeah, the package is. Yeah, you know, there was, there were two uh, alternate ads. One was some additional crack repair at RCA Park that is not in the playing area, but it looks really nice if you repair those cracks. And the second one was the bird bass at Bryan Park. So those were the two add ons. Thank you. Okay. All right. I think we're ready for a motion on this one, B14. Okay. I'll move to approve. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Motion carried. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. And then we'll move into section C, which is our reports section. And Tim Street will, I think, be back to tell us about the Jackson Creek Trail Phase 2. Yes. Hello again, Tim Street, Operations Director. Uh, wanted to give a chance to talk to you a little bit about the Jackson Creek Trail extension that is currently ongoing. Uh, this is not a parks managed product at the moment, but it will be a parks uh, impact trail when it's finished. So uh, the city's engineering department is leading this project uh, in part because this is relying on federal funds through the MPO uh, and in part because uh, part of the scope of the project is also going north of the park. Uh, so the Jackson Creek Trail, as you, as you know, currently runs from uh, the Winslow Road <clears throat> roundabout uh, down south where it crosses Jackson Creek and connects up to Alcott Park. Uh, Kim, you've got a map. If you could put that up, that would be wonderful. Uh, phase two, which is really kind of phase two and phase three, according to the master plan, uh, is, is started now. Uh, so currently, uh, crews are working on this first picture on the left, uh, which will connect from the Winslow roundabout uh, at the south end up to Southeast Park via Arden Drive and High Street, uh, up there in sort of the top right corner. Uh, the goal of the engineering department is to have this section ready by the time the school year uh, 
convenes in fall because there are lots of kids who, who use this path to walk to school along there. Uh, so that's the part of the trail that's sort of uh, outside of the park's realm. Uh, we will not have responsibility for that trail going forward, uh, though it does provide a really great connection between Southeast Park and uh, the Jackson Creek Trail as it currently stands. So if, you, if you've driven on High Street lately, you've probably seen utility crews uh, working to relocate some utilities for this project, um, as well as some tree removals to make way for that path. When that section is complete this fall, uh, the project will turn its attention southward um, off of the south end of the roundabout at the bridge across Jackson Creek. Uh, currently, that's at the, the top end of the picture on the right. Um, that is where the bridge across Jackson Creek connects Sherwood Oaks Park to the path that goes up to Alcott Park. <clears throat> this next section uh, will be built heading south uh, along that. Uh, there's the Henke Farmstead, uh, which is kind of there uh, immediately. Uh, following Jackson Creek south to Aurora Road. That's Aurora Road at the, the bottom there, uh, where it will turn east, cross the creek via a new bridge, and connect to some set existing side path that serves Jackson Creek uh, School right there. So uh, when that section is complete, which won't be begun until 2021, late 2021, and then finished in 2022 at some point, um, that will become a parks <clears throat> trail uh, that we manage as part of the trail corridor between the Winslow Roundabout in Aurora Road. So uh, we wanted to give you that update um, that th this is ongoing, that the plans have been out there for a while uh, and that this is being led by the engineering department and, and coordinated with us as it, as it moves along. Happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you for that update, Tim. Any questions for Tim from Ellen or Israel? And I was just curious, um, sorry, so in the new southern section, yeah, kind of where the mouse is actually, oh, up there, yeah, at the top, that's where, so that's, um, there's a little Sherwood donut, Park. there's a donut roundabout right there, kind of where the bridge is at the south end of Sherwood Oaks Park, and yeah. if, you, if you go by there now, you'll actually see that um, some trees have been, have been culled to make way for the path later this year. Okay. Um, they were dropped before uh, the bat law deadline kicked in and will be cleaned up by the contractor later this year as part of getting that trail ready. Okay, cool. And so there's no existing trail all the way. And then that is that a private driveway there or which, what? It, it actually is. So, and I don't know the history of this exactly, um, but there is city owned property that I believe was acquired there. Um, there is some, some sewer infrastructure uh, along here, that's that's pretty important. Um, okay. So that driveway exists on city property, um, and there's basically two kind of three uh, residents back there that have an ingress egress right of way along it. But they are responsible for the driveway, um, and at points the new trail will run alongside the driveway. Cool. And then where it goes just a little bit further south, what road is that? Will it be alongside a road there? Yeah, right that there. Is uh, that is the driveway. That is the driveway. Oh, that's it's a the driveway. Very long oh, okay, drive okay. all the way down to Aurora Road. Yeah. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's, so that's great. just um, that's an unimproved gravel drive. What a really great connection that's gonna be to Roar. And they do the, the Hanky Farm does have goats, so you'll be able to see goats out there as you go past. Continue <laughs> with our theme. That's right. <laughs> what's what's the road uh, at the bottom? Is that that uh, is Roar, that is Aurora Road. Right, and in the northern section, the one at the top is? That goes up to Arden, I believe it's Place, Arden Place, uh, which turns in. And then where it terminates at the east there is basically the, the south entrance to Southeast Park. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that's going to be great. Oh, nice. So thank you, team. Yeah, yes. it'll, it'll be a little while before we see this impact for us but uh wanted to give you that update and i'll just ju i'll just no, jump ahead, in here no. too um looking at the uh, northern section so it goes into southeast park you can walk through the park and then right there along morris creek then turn in immediately and take the renwick trail which we now own and you can take that all the way through to sarah road where it now has the um completed side path and Sarah Road, you can take south all the way back 
down and hook into this new southern section. So the miles and the options um, and the connections um, when this gets complete is, is going to be really, really nice. Lots of options, lots of miles. Yeah. Yeah, the connectivity is great. And especially along Roar, like I hate that section actually on a bike I'm, or even running. I've run just like in the ditch basically along Roar when you're trying to go from one side to the other. Well, there's that big hill right there that, you know, mm -hmm. they just come in and then turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And I appreciate yeah, too. I, yeah, I know there are tons tons of kids that use that uh, to go to and from Jackson Creek. So it's nice to have that be wrapped up before school resumes again in August. So, all right, thank, thank you, Tim. You're um, very welcome. And then we have another report uh, from Rebecca Swift about outer spatial mobile application. Yes, so excited to finally present this to you all. Um, we're really proud of to present and debut the City of Bloomington Parks and Recreation Community on Outer Spatial. It's a free mobile app that's available on Android and Apple products. So you can go on there right now, download it, and if you're anywhere near the City of Bloomington, it's going to automatically recommend and say that you should be part of this community. Um, users can expect to find all of our parks and trails amenities listed on here. We've been working hard to update our GIS data that kind of feeds into the app to again represent, you see here pictured Griffey Lake, some of the trails out there, um, maybe some different amenities including parking, restrooms, picnic areas, um, and not just that, but users can also find out information on upcoming events, uh, volunteer opportunities, things like our weed wrangles that have been really successful with MC Iris, as well as our concert in the park series. So it's kind of like parks and recreation in your pocket. And again, it's free, it's really user-friendly. And I hope that if you haven't already after today, uh, you will download it and check us out. Okay. And so there's a, a lot of information on that, that page there, but I'm happy to answer any questions and talk about this all day. <laughs> I'm downloading it right now. Well, actually, I got thwarted because I forgot my password, but I'm working on it. So I can download it. I, I love this, Rebecca. I mean, I, you know, tend to know where things are, you know, locally, but, um, but not everything. I mean, navigation while on the trails and new places. And I could also imagine visitors to town. I mean, I've been visiting cities before where I think, oh, I have a, a few extra hours while I'm here for some other event. I wonder what I could do. And then this way, people who might be visiting Bloomington could connect with the parks through this. So this looks great. We'll get a report from Ellen on after she resets her password. So Yeah, it's you just hit the nail on the head as far as it's really great for people new to Bloomington, but especially people just you know, I'll be honest, when, when I first moved here, I didn't get out much and realize that how many parks and trails were right by me. Um, I can tell you that internally, having new staff come on board, being able to say, download this app, and, and this will take you right to different parks. You know, don't get me wrong, you know, Google Maps and stuff like that can go only so far. But when it comes to like a detailed experience um, for our parks and our properties, and again, we'll continue to update this with, with new information, the closures of playgrounds as they update, the additions of new trails. So it will constantly be evolving and, and growing, but it's, it's again, very user-friendly and, and I hope you enjoy it. I'm already in and I'm looking at Griffey Boathouse Hours. So I know when to go rent a paddleboard. And I'll have, it looks like it, your, the concert schedule is going to be on there, so which is perfect. And then will it push out alerts, like say it rains and the Bryan Park concert's canceled, um, you know, they make the call, will that, will it put, do you do like push notification type things of that type, type of information? That would be a very awesome feature. I do know right now that a lot of it is based on just us as managers updating the, at the event. So you as the user would just have to check back. And I know that we have, we bet embed a lot of hyperlinks in this app. So it can take you to different things. Some of which, you know, a lot of our events end up at Facebook. 
we understand not everybody's on Facebook nor wants to be. So that is another reason of why we want to market our events this way. Um, but it, it should link people to, to our rec track system or to our city website that we do update with, with information, whether it's weather related or unfortunately COVID cancellations, but hopefully we don't have to do that moving forward. Um, but yes, that's a great question. Cool, very cool, thanks so much. Okay, great, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, um, Rebecca, yeah, very interesting. And then finally to our section D public hearings and appearances. First, we have our Bravo award for Daniel Muller, Building Trades Park Ambassador. I think I saw him come into the meeting a little earlier. All right, thank you. Um, yes, Sarah Owen, Community Relations Quarter. Um, this month with the Bravo Award, which is to recognize our outstanding volunteers, we are wanting to recognize um, another of our park ambassadors. Uh, we had the uh, recognition last month uh, last month for our ambassador for Alcott Park, and this month it is for Building Trades Park. Um, Danny Muller has been with the Park Ambassador Program since 2017, and he has just recently renewed for another term, which will extend into 2023. We're looking forward to working with him still, and he has been very dedicated to the Building Trades Park. He lives nearby. He's really invested in this neighborhood park as in making it uh, his own and cares deeply about it. Um, in no small part, based on his feedback over these past few years. There have been improvements um, with the help of our operations uh, division, including improved lighting and uh, upgrading some of the fencing there. So that is all part of the feedback that we get from our park ambassadors. And um, we've just, over the past few years, he has uh, logged about 70 hours of his time, and we are very grateful to his service. The park ambassador program started in 2011. Building Trades is one of the original parks, uh, part of that lineup. And this is a program where our ambassadors interact with park users, inform them of the amenities at the parks, and remind them maybe of park ordinances like leashing your dog, things like that. Um, but they really provide us full feedback on any uh, maintenance issues, upkeep issues that we need to attend to. So we're very proud to recognize um, Danny with the Bravo Award this month. And as you said, he is in the meeting right now, so I'll turn it over to him to say a couple words. Hey everybody, hope you guys can hear me okay. Um, it's who doesn't like to be recognized, right? <laughs> but uh, I promise I won't take the 10 minutes. I don't get the music going to cue me out slowly into the sunset. But uh, I really just wanted to thank everybody for all of their you know, ears and, and action. Uh, when I first moved, there wasn't really any negativity in the park. And uh, soon enough, we did have a lot of unfortunate occurrences. And so I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And um, thanks to the help of all you guys from top to bottom, <clears throat> we've really made it a better place for everyone, um, including the safety of the police officers that, that go in there, the, the social workers that we've been seeing through Stone Belt, the resource officers, um, you know, name it just top to bottom. So in the last year, we've really seen a lot of good um, good, good uses of the park, a lot less illegal activity. And hopefully, you know, as COVID goes out, we, we continue to see the same thing. And, um, I really think the safety and wellness of the park directly extends out into the neighborhood. So I really felt like it was in a going in the wrong direction. So I really think thanks to you guys that that has been made and hopefully we, uh, we continue that. So I, once again, just want to say thank you to everybody. I really appreciate all that you guys do and the neighbors in our community also appreciate it. So thank you. Thank Yeah. Thank you, Danny. And there's nothing like having somebody who's right there in the neighborhood. I mean, that's the best person to say what the concerns are. And as you, as you said, what you see on a kind of daily basis, that's positive or needs correction. So thank you very much for all those volunteer hours and for, joining up for another another couple of years of volunteering. No problem, I'm here for the long haul. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Danny. Congratulations, Danny. Yeah, thank you for your service, your outstanding service. We really appreciate it. Agreed. It's great to see community members just taking ownership and making Bloomington what it is in our little local neighborhoods and parks, so thanks. My pleasure. Thanks again, guys. Right. And uh, then we have a staff recognition of Clarence Boone, 
Program Facility Coordinator. And I'm not sure who's presenting this. Well, I'm never at a loss for words. So I, I like to just <laughs> thank everyone for uh, welcoming me uh, this afternoon. Uh, and a special thanks before I go any further to Paula, Rebecca, Leslie, Kim, Sarah, and everyone in the uh, division that have, they have, that have gone out of their way just to make me feel welcome and make me feel a part of a dynamic team. Uh, I'm really impressed with the organization and how things are conducted here. And uh, I'm just uh, really looking forward to the, uh, the task at hand, and that is to coordinate uh, the farmer's market and work with Sarah on the uh, community gardens. I know I submitted an official um, introduction to the board. There is one part of that that I really want to just refer back to because I think it really sums up who I am. It's my personal mission statement. And I take this to heart that my passion is to enlist multiple communities and cultures who embrace a variety of personal experiences, values, and worldviews into the fabric of the city of Bloomington and to create such meaningful engagements for these participants that they'll commit their time, their talent, ideas, and we used to say treasures in the fundraising world, but I'll say their resources to the life of their municipality. Uh, I'm experienced in university advancement, enrollment management, and alumni relations, and also residence life. I was a coordinator at Briscoe Quad for several years. And for those of you smiling, you know how undergraduate dorms are. Uh, but I was frontline with 20 staff and a couple of assistant coordinators, and we, we worked hard to get students out of the room and into the life of the university. And I really treasure those experiences. I also love community volunteerism. Um, my professional experiences, well, I'm sorry, my volunteer experiences to that point include work uh, as an assistant pastor at Lighthouse Community Church. Uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed my participation as a group facilitator and planning and design team member with the Noah's Ark Community Dialogues on Faith, Race, Racism, and Healing. Uh, for 16 years, I volunteered as a producer of Bring It On. It's, it's a Black public affairs radio uh, broadcast at WFHB, which is a community radio station. And I've, I've also volunteered with the Bloomington chapter of Habitat for Humanity and served on the board of directors for the Community Kitchen in the Monroe County United Way. Uh, and the highlight of, of this whole introduction is I've been married to Ann Logan Boone for 18 wonderful years. And we are blessed with two beautiful daughters, Anaya, age 12, going on 30, and Elena, age 8, going on 20. So help me if you have suggestions, I, I welcome them. And again, while it's been said that in diversity, diversity, there is beauty and there is strength, it is certainly true that we all smile in the same language. So again, thank you for welcoming me on board, a dynamic team, I'm ready to roll up my sleeves. I'm ready for Saturdays that don't rain. Um, and I'm ready to disengage more people at the community market. So I'll take some questions and answer if I can. If not, I'll call on Leslie to jump in. <laughs> well, well, welcome, Clarence. You sound like the ideal person for this job. So. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I really like the experiences thus far at the farmer's market, and we have some wonderful vendors and, and of course, food and beverage artisans. Uh, when Peely's brings the food truck in, it just everybody just wakes up because Peely's is here. So, and there are other outstanding artisans as well. But uh, uh, again, I look forward to the months and years to come. Excellent. Well, I look forward to, to meeting you in person down there when that when I can get down to the market next time. So welcome and uh, appreciate all the experience that you have. Well, thank you, Kathleen. And thank you, everyone else on the board. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for, for all your work. And, and I really like your, your words regarding diversity, embracing multiculturalism, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that line about we smile in the same language, that is impactful. So yes. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was just going to ask how we got so lucky. So, <laughs> and well, actually, oh, go ahead. Well, I, I have a mentor. And I have someone who was really an inspiration to me. His name was, uh, was brought up the other day, and Norm Merrifield, who he and I go way back. Uh, he was involved in one of the alumni groups that I coordinated at the IU Alumni Association. 
Norm was a passionate, passionate individual who had his, uh, his ears to the pulse of the city. And at times back when there were challenges decades ago, he and I would talk about it. But Norm was truly someone who inspired me and so many others uh, at IU. But um, not that he called up and said, hey, here's a great position. I just had my eyes peeled and I thought, you know, I want to lend my talents to this. Oh, well, we are definitely going to be the recipients of that, that are going to get all the benefit of, of that. So, and a fun fact, I uh, worked at Briscoe myself, <laughs> 2007 to 2009, when I was back in grad school. <laughs> well, I, I was a, a university hearing officer with disciplinary issues, and that fortunately was after my time, and you would not have appeared before me, I, and I know that, I just know. No, no, no. I worked there too. Yeah. And, and <laughs> heard some of those same hearings. So yes, <laughs> but uh, that was, everyone should have that experience. Um, uh, because as a student, I lived in, in, in foster, well, in uh, foster quad. And so going back as a coordinator, I'm having all these flashbacks, like, oh my gosh, but uh, everyone should have such similar experiences. Well, welcome. We're so well, thank glad you. to have you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Clarence. And then um, finally, in the last portion of the meeting here, we have a public comment period. If there's anyone who wants to comment, they can raise a hand here on Zoom and Kim can recognize you for two minutes or we can also take comments if anyone has emailed any to Paula or put any on Facebook. We'll take just a second and see if we have any comments. I don't have anything in my email, Kathleen. Okay. There is someone watching on Facebook Live who would like to submit a question, and he is typing it now, I believe. Okay. All right. Thanks. I'll share it as soon as I get it. Okay. Julie, he's posted a question. It relates to asking about pump tracks. Kathleen, I believe there is one other person. Okay, yes, I see the raised hands from Carol Canfield as well. Yes, I'll go ahead and un ask her to unmute. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to address the Lower Cascades road closure briefly. Um, first of all, this is not a realistic time to conduct this pilot in the middle of a pandemic. You can't gauge what the traffic on the north side of town is because we have no events bringing traffic to town. I'm a resident of Blue Ridge and we can't get out of our addition unless we have access through Lower Cascades. It's the only means we have to get from one side of town to the other. Uh, because we can't get out on North Walnut, we can't get out on Dunn Street. So we have to turn right, go down the hill, turn left into the park and traverse our way through and come out on the other side of the by bypass. I'm wondering how emergency vehicles are supposed to get through uh, with that road closure. If you have something that happens in the park, how's an ambulance supposed to get there? If you have an ambulance that's being blocked by the traffic that we experience in Blue Ridge, but is up on the north side and needs a route out, where do you expect them to go if they can't go through the park? Also, most families rely on cars. Cars don't have to be the enemy of the city. And this is, this is the impression I get that you're trying to eliminate cars. And the thing is cars, 
people rely on their cars to take their families places, including this park. And your senior citizens, you're, you're blocking out a whole segment of people, um, senior citizens who can't be as uh, ambulatory as they once were, uh, people who have handicap issues, whatever. We don't have the means to get through the park now. And you should not be eliminating people from enjoying this park. Um, people don't know about this road closure either. I talk to people virtually every day because I'm very concerned about this. And people are just not aware. It has not been publicized well in any of the public meets. And you can say, well, go to the, the uh, survey on, online. People don't know where to look for this. We need information hitting the public what's actually happening so they know what's at stake. Because this, this has been sorely missing this past year. I've been watching this like a hawk and we're getting nowhere with this. And what you are in essence doing is knocking out a whole bunch of people from being able to enjoy this park. How is that inclusive? How that is, is that? That is our two minutes. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you for thank you for your comments, Carol. And we have another, do we have a question there on Facebook as well? Yes, there is a comment from okay. John Salva. He says, we have a problem with adults at the Switchyard Park in the afternoon, driving young kids out of the skate park with their loud music with explicit lyrics. It may or may not include the consumption of alcohol too. He follows up that comment with a question. Also, are there plans to provide an avenue for BMX bikers, like a pump track? Okay, all right, thank you. And that, that is the end. Okay, thank you, Julie. And thank you for that comment. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, I don't, I, I have seen BMX tracks in some other locations, but I don't know that there are any plans for that immediately, but thank you for that, for those comments and those concerns. And uh, we'll turn over to Paula then to wrap us up. Great, thank you, yes, and thank you to um, our public for their comments, and uh, I will certainly pass those along to staff. I do know uh, natural resources in Steve Cotter's area, there has been some research and discussion done about uh, pump tracks, and we'll certainly uh, take a look at the situation on the skate park down in Switchyard Park. So that again, uh, we're really grateful for citizens' eyes and ears out there uh, keeping us informed. And thank you, Carol, for your comments as well. Um, just a few things. Uh, thank you all. I wanna give a shout out to uh, Kim and Julie again for managing this meeting behind the scenes and all the bells and whistles, every, it's just so fluid these days. It's wonderful, so thank you. Um, just a reminder that our May Park Board meeting is uh, going to be Thursday, May 20th, due to a conflict on the original scheduled date. So um, I know Kim will be getting that information posted uh, starting yet this week, so people uh, know when our May meeting is. And then just, uh, Reminder, our, hopefully you've all received your summer program guides in the mail. If not, oh, you're all nodding your heads, great. Um, our program registration is live. So if uh, community members are out there and are looking for things to do and would like to register, um, that is all live. We are, again, obviously following COVID precautions and monitoring uh, those regulations every day, um, but uh, trying to find our way as we uh, get prepared for our, our big season of spring and summer. Um, and then finally, I, I hope you've read, but uh, on a very regular basis, every Tuesday, the Office of the Mayor puts out a project update of which several of our projects are highlighted. So that is um, our way of communicating to our, our residents about a lot of city projects, just like uh, Tim gave you an update. If you're driving along and you're wondering what is that project or um, the Waldron Hill Buskirk Park is kind of torn up right now with the Hidden River Project. But um, again, those communications go out every Tuesday in a press release format and in, uh, include several of our park projects. So just our way of keeping everybody updated and informed. 
And that is all I have for today. And thank you for your time this afternoon. All right, thank you, Paula. And we are adjourned for our April meeting of the Bloomington Board of Park Commissioners.